Hello everybody and welcome to our Module 11 discussion. In this week we are switching from financial accounting to managerial accounting and we're going to talk about the topic of cost in general. This is part one of two-part session for Module 11. In part one we're going to be introducing managerial accounting and then we'll talk about cost classifications in general. That's part one. In part two we're going to come back and talk about two types of analysis that is used for various types of cost, high-low method and the cost volume profit analysis method. So first of all, since this is our first week covering managerial accounting, we need to really define managerial accounting and compare and contrast it to financial accounting that we've been spending the past 10 modules on. So managerial accounting, as the name implies, is information used by management to make decisions about how best to run the company. So the information that we're going to see in our discussions of managerial accounting, it's more internal information that is generally not communicated outside of the company. It's used by management and those within the company. On the other hand, financial accounting that we've been talking about for the past 10 modules is used by external users. At least that's the, that's the main purpose, the main intent. Yes, internal users can certainly use this information, but it's communicated out to external users so they can make decisions about whether or not to invest in the company or not, whether to lend money to the company. So again, this information is mainly used by external users. And the reason I say that is that it's the only source of information they have. They don't have access directly into the company's books. They have to use the financial statements from the company to make decisions. So now we're going to compare and contrast managerial and financial accounting from a few different angles. The first element we're going to look at here is the different types of reports that you would see in the two types of accounting. So for managerial accounting, we're talking more special purpose financial reports. They're developed, whether it be by the software developer that sells the company a suite of software, or maybe they're customized within the company, but they're special purpose and for the most part, and they're they're customized to what the managers want to see. Different levels of management may get different types of reports and different depths of reports. Whereas the financial accounting, because this is used by external users, there needs to be some standardization applied so that external users like investors and such can compare one company to the other and it would that comparison would be possible because the financial statements themselves look pretty much the same they're designed in the same way the same rules apply so these are more general purpose financial statements and there are really four of them that we're talking about the income statement statement of owners equity the balance sheet and the cash flow statement regardless of which company you look at the these four statements are very well prescribed by GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Therefore, they're going to be similar enough that you can make comparisons between companies. Managerial accounting information, if you start working at one company and you see their reports and you go to the next company, you may see completely different reports. There are likely to be some similarities, some standard reports, but there are a lot of other things that are going to be completely custom to that company. Now let's move on to the timeliness of reports, timeliness of that information. With Let's go down to financial accounting first. We're talking high-level summary data, and it's just about the entire company as a whole. The investors don't need this as frequently, so we're generally talking quarterly and annually. Certainly, if this is a publicly traded company, they are required to submit quarterly and annual reports. The annual reports, in fact, have to be audited by an external entity. Now, you know, occasionally on the corporate website, you might see some unaudited monthly data, but the big things there would be quarterly and annually. With managerial accounting, yes, you're definitely going to see annual and quarterly results as well, but you might see monthly, weekly, daily, even hourly or real-time reports, depending on what that company needs to see to make decisions. A good example, if you've ever worked at, it's usually a restaurant where you'll see this, but if you work with a restaurant, the managers and supervisors are generally going to run hourly reports to see how the labor cost up to that point in the shift matches with the sales. 
if they staffed for so many people, but then the sales aren't coming in, maybe it's raining out or snowing out, or maybe it's just not a busy day, they may tell some people they can leave a little early that day. That's the idea of an hourly report, but again, that's just one of many, many examples. Reporting standards. So with managerial accounting, you're not generally going to, I stress that, generally going to see external reporting standards required because, again, this information is for internal use, so it's not up to the government or to any board to set standards on how they use their own information. But there are some exceptions where Cost Accounting Standards Board applies standards. And this is situations, you know, one of the situations I work with, we work for the Medicare program we audit hospital cost reports for the Medicare program and there are a variety of regulations including these cost accounting standards that come into play because the government is reimbursing hospitals so they want to make sure that the cost data was developed properly before they use that to reimburse hospitals insurance claims uh, they might expect to see some more detailed cost accounting standards applied before they allow your cost records to be used to generate a claim for them. So with managerial accounting, because there are no external reporting standards required and therefore there's not a full-blown audit required of the company, not an external audit at least, the timeliness of data is more important than accuracy or reliability, which at first sounds bad, but they're basically saying, yeah, of course we want accurate data, but we're not going to spend the extra time, the extra few months at the end of a quarter or a year to go through a full-blown audit to make sure these reports are accurate. They want the data now, the best estimate of data, a reasonably reliable data. They want it quickly to make decisions. With financial accounting, on the other hand, it's for external users and accuracy is extremely important. Accuracy and reliability, it is even more important than timeliness because investors want to make sure the information they're using to make investment decisions about this company is reliable. There are very stringent standards applied. We have generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. These are applied and companies have to follow them before they communicate their financial statements. Now let's look at the focus of the data. With managerial accounting, yeah, they're going to use some past data like any company would, but the big concern with managerial accounting is in predicting the future. We're talking budgets, we're talking just plans for the future, goals. So we want to see the future data partially based on past data, but we're, again, setting budgets for the future. This is a very detailed scale. But, of course, you do need to see the big picture, how everything rolls up. But you have to see the detail because that's where things are changed. You have to change them at the detail level so they can get up to the big picture level. With financial accounting, we are solely looking at what has happened in the past. Reporting on historical costs, past decisions. Now, that's not to say that analysts and investors are not going to use that to make predictions but that's on them if they want to make predictions. The company's responsibility is to report what has happened accurately, reliably, and in accordance with GAAP. So they're much more concerned for financial accounting with a high-level summary of data than the details themselves. Now let's look at the certifications to wrap this discussion up. With uh, managerial accounting, I mean, there are, of course, for any level of accounting, there are a variety of certifications, but one of the biggest ones for managerial accounting would be the Certified Management Accountant, the CMA. And this is earned through the Institute of Management Accountants, the IMA. Now, if you go into the financial accounting side, you have the Certified Public Accountant, CPA, and this is earned through the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Now, the CPA is pretty broad, it covers a lot of things, financial accounting, taxation, auditing, all of that. Now, this is not to say that this certificate only applies to managerial accounting and cannot be used at all for the other accounting. They're very valuable for any level of accounting you go into, just to show that you are able to set a goal 
to study and pass a rigorous exam, meet the licensure requirements, so they're very important. But obviously for certain things, uh, public accounting, for example, auditing, and even sometimes taxation, the CPA would be required. So now let's move on to the discussion of cost, which is going to drive a lot of our discussions in the later modules of this 15-week session. We've heard the term expense before, and cost is very similar to an expense. There are some differences that we'll talk about in just a bit, but the cost itself is defined as the expenditure of something like money, time, or labor necessary for the attainment of a goal. So you're giving up something to reach a goal. So let's bring in the discussion of cost versus expense. It is largely a timing difference. That's the main point here. But the other thing about this is when we say timing difference, some costs are assets initially, and then eventually they get converted to expense. Generally, we're talking inventory there. But let's get into this for a bit here. With the timing difference, expenses have certain rules under the accrual basis of accounting before they can be counted as an expense. They have to be incurred. We have to use up the benefit of whatever we paid for. It's not just paying for it that calls something an expense. It's using up the underlying benefit. We spread that expense out as it's being used. Cost, on the other hand, is largely we purchase something. It may not be an expense yet, and but it's eventually going to be an expense in most cases. Now, there are many different classifications of cost. We're going to dig into much more detail on the various ones in later sections, but we're going to introduce some of them right now. The first one, and I would largely say this is the most important one in all of the classifications, is variable versus fixed. We want to know how a particular cost relates to a change in total volume or activity. In other words, if we double our activity level, what do we expect the cost to do? What I'm going to say is that some of them would likely double, but other of those costs would not. They might not even change at all. So that's the difference between variable and fixed. It's how a, cha a cost is affected by a change in activity. One thing we need to bring into the discussion here is what's known as the relevant range assumption, which basically says we have a certain capacity that when we purchase the fixed cost, the factory, the equipment, whatever, it allows us to have a certain capacity. Up to that level, whether we produce one unit, 10 units, or if the capacity is 100,000 units, up to that level, we don't have to incur any new fixed costs. We bought the factory, it's going to work for us for the next you know, 100,000 units or whatever. But this relevant range assumption is basically saying once we're outside of our capacity, and then we have to invest in new fixed costs to expand. So the relevant range assumption we're making is that for any of these things we're going to talk about over the next few slides, we are assuming we're still within our initial relevant range, our initial level of capacity. The linear cost assumption Basically, the easiest way of saying this is that it, it ignores the potential for any volume discounts. For example, if we have a customer that all of a sudden, you know, they've been buying 100 units uh, a year, and then all of a sudden they bump up to 100,000 units, they're probably going to expect a volume discount. And if we purchase materials on a large scale, we're probably expecting a volume discount. But what we're saying for our purposes is that we're ignoring any potential impact of volume discounts. We're saying every unit, every pound of material, for example, that we buy costs the same whether we buy one pound or a million pounds. It's the same per unit. This also tells us there are no economies of scale, no efficiencies to be gained by operating at a larger scale. That's what this is all about. So now let's look at variable versus fixed costs. Variable costs are those that increase in total, that's the keyword total here, as the activity level increases. It's a set amount per unit. For example, tires on a car. If we produce twice as many cars, we're definitely going to need twice as many tires. If we have certain labor hours needed to build the car, if we produce twice as many cars, we're going to need twice as many labor hours. 
Those are variable costs. They increase in the same direction and proportion in total as the activity level increases. But again, so the variable part is how it changes in total. It, variable means changing. It changes in total. On a per unit basis, though, it's the exact same amount per unit. $10 per unit, $15 per unit, no matter what. Then you just multiply it by the number of units. Fixed costs, on the other hand, assuming we are within our relevant range of capacity, then the total fixed cost is going to be the exact same whether we produce one unit, 100 units, or up to 100,000 if that's our capacity. The fixed cost in total is the same. Now, if we wanted to, if we wanted to know how much we did have on a per unit basis, even though fixed cost does not directly relate to the number of units we produced, if we wanted to spread that out over the number of units, we could simply divide it by the number of units. But the trick to this is understanding that as soon as that number of units changes, the cost per unit is going to look like it changed as well. Let's say we have $100,000 of fixed cost. If we just produce one unit, the fixed cost per unit of that one unit is $100,000 per unit, which is crazy. If we produce 1,000 units, we take that 100,000 divided by 1,000, now the fixed cost per unit is 100. We increased our activity, and the cost per unit went down for fixed cost. If we go all the way up to our capacity and we produce 100,000 units, that $100,000 in cost divided by 100,000 units, now it's going to look like every unit only had $1 fixed cost. So the point here is that fixed cost in total is fixed. It's locked. It remains the same. But if we try to create that per unit amount by dividing it by the number of units, then all of a sudden it 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 uh, inversely changes. It's inversely correlated to the number of units we have. So if we increase the units, the cost per unit decreases. If we decrease the units, the cost per unit increases. So just keep that in mind. Now some additional terms that come into play with the variable versus fixed. We have step cost and mixed cost. What I want to point out with step cost is that it's it's a term that was kind of thrown into the mix, but really every cost could arguably be a step cost. A variable cost steps up every unit you produce. You have one more amount of that cost. So the, the steps per se on variable cost, it's every unit. With fixed cost, it does change, but it's a much, much wider range. It's whatever your capacity was. Every 100,000 units we produce, all of a sudden we have to buy a new factory. That's kind of what we're saying there. So fixed cost could technically become a step cost as well, but when they use the term step cost, they're generally talking about somewhere in the middle. They're saying, hey, every batch we produce, every... 50 units or 100 units, all of a sudden we have a new level of batch cost. So a step cost just means every, again, every little batch we produce, 100 units, 1,000 units, whatever, we have this new level of step cost. That's all we're getting at there. Now a mixed cost, which will come become very important in our part two, this is a cost that has some component of variable and some component of fixed cost. An example there would be utilities. Utilities generally, like electricity, they have a connection fee that's a base rate, no matter how many hour, kilowatt hours you use, just having the connection that month costs you a certain amount. Now, every kilowatt hour you use on top of that is, of course, going to cost you more and more and more. The connection cost would be your fixed component, and the per kilowatt hour uh, rate would be your variable cost. So we're going to come back in part two and dig into this one much more deep. Now we'll talk about direct versus indirect. That's another classification. So by the way, I do want to clarify, a cost could be, for example, variable. Uh, you know, variable versus fixed, it could be variable. And then it might also be direct or even indirect. So you can pick from each of these classifications. It's one of these and one of these, they're just different uh, ways of describing the cost, the behavior. 
direct versus indirect talks about the ability to trace that particular cost to an individual product. If it's direct, then we know how much of that cost goes to each unit of product. This would include your direct materials and direct labor. So think about that vehicle example, the tires. The tire cost as a direct material directly relates to each unit. We know how much of that cost goes to each and every unit. Direct labor, we know how many hours people have worked on that individual vehicle. Indirect costs, on the other hand, is basically whatever is left. Costs that cannot be easily traced to each unit of product. These are the factory overhead costs, like indirect materials or indirect labor. Those are the materials and labor that we either can't trace to each product easily, or they're just so small dollar-wise that it's not worth the extra effort. So we just put it into a big bucket of overhead, and we allocate it out in a more efficient way. We'll see that part in many of the other discussions throughout the next few weeks. Depreciation would be another indirect cost. Utilities, they don't relate to any one product. They're related to the production overall. Now, indirect costs can be either variable or fixed. By their nature, direct costs tend to be variable because you know they directly relate to a number of, or to a unit of product. So the more products we produce, the more of those direct costs we have. But indirect can be either variable or fixed, or possibly mixed, like the electricity example. Another classification would be product versus period. How does this cost relate to production? Or does it not relate to production? It just relates to running the company. If it's a product cost, it relates to production either directly, like direct materials or direct labor, or indirectly, like manufacturing overhead. Basically, it means it relates to the factory somehow or to manufacturing. A period cost, on the other hand, does not relate to production. It does not relate to the factory. It relates to the store, the office, the headquarters, anything like that. Some additional terms, committed versus discretionary. These tend to be talked about when we talk about fixed costs and it's how well we can control that particular type of cost in the short run. If it's a committed cost, we generally cannot change it in the short run. It's something we've locked ourselves into, a contract we've signed, a building we've purchased that's supposed to last 15, 20 years. It cannot easily be changed. I shouldn't say cannot be changed at all. It cannot easily be changed without possible penalties or losses. Discretionary costs, on the other hand, they can be adjusted at management's discretion pretty easily in the short run. These are like advertising costs, charity costs. If the company needs to change those, they can without any major issues. And in our final slide for part one, we have some additional terms that I want to talk about. Some of these come up in later chapters. Actually, all of these come up in later chapters, but I want to introduce them here. A differential cost is a cost that is different under two different alternatives. So alternative A versus alternative B, if we make this decision, then we're going to have this batch of costs. If we make this other decision, maybe automate our factory, we're going to have a different mix of costs. So a differential cost is one that differs between those two alternatives. Allocated costs are those, they, and they tend to be fixed costs just by their nature. They're costs that really don't relate directly to any, any specific department. They relate to the company overall, but we still have to figure out the best way to allocate them out. And how we do that is discussed in later sections of this, of this uh, course. Sunk costs are those basically that are not different over two alternatives because they've already been incurred. And they'll stay incurred regardless of which alternative we take. It's something that we've paid for in the past. Maybe we invested in a, in a piece of equipment. And now we have the choice to buy a new equipment or stick with the old equipment. The amount we paid for the old equipment is irrelevant to either of those two decisions because it's already locked in. We already paid it. The only things that are relevant are costs that will happen in the future 
and that will differ between the two alternatives. Finally, opportunity costs. These are costs that are the same idea. We have two different alternatives, and let's say we chose alternative A, we gave up alternative B, we decided not to go that route. Alternative B probably had some good benefits to it. Yes, it had costs, but it had some good benefits as well. The fact that we did not choose alternative B, and instead we chose alternative A, means that we're giving up something that alternative B could have given us. That's an opportunity cost. We're giving up the opportunity to get the benefits from alternative B. It's just something you have to consider when you choose one alternative over the other. You have to consider it in your comparison. That takes us to the end of Module 11, Part 1. We're going to come back in Part 2, and we're going to talk about the high-low method and the cost-volume-profit analysis. So I will see you in our next session.